yeah guys so everyone watch here and let me know if you are not able to you know uh, see the video or hear the sound in the video being the dominant one but both are fine because one of the most famous them. traits of the San is the clicks they use when speaking. Famous click languages like Hossa actually borrow their clicks from the San. The Khoi San languages are some of the most complex in the world. The clicks are represented in our alphabet with symbols such as and like in the name Kung. Also, it's best to just assume that I'm doing the click sounds wrong because I definitely am. Genetic analysis has revealed that the San are one of, if not the oldest people on Earth. A 2016 DNA study of the San showed that the ancestors of today's San began to diverge from other human populations in Africa around 150,000 years ago. Humans have only been around for about 200,000 years. The San stayed in Southern Africa while the others moved out across the planet. The San have remained a distinct ethnic group since then. Today there are roughly 100,000 San people. They've traditionally lived in and near the 900,000 square kilometer Kalahari Desert of Namibia and Botswana. This is a seemingly endless dry bush desert. It's monotonous plains, hot and scorching. This is a land of thirst, earth, parched, animals hide from the sun under the few trees available, and drought is common. For the last 150,000 years, the San have lived here as hunter-gatherers. To survive here, the San had to learn everything they could about their environment. They catalogued more than 100 species of plants and learned which were edible, which were medicinal, and which will kill you. Anthropologist Richard B. Lee went to study the San in 1963. His study of the San was conducted during one of Southern Africa's worst droughts. In Botswana, 180,000 people were being kept alive by United Nations famine relief. But the San, whose diet Lee examined during this period, incredibly ate 2,140 calories and 93.1 grams of protein each per day. 8.3% more calories and 55% more protein than their recommended daily allowance. In San society, women gathered and men hunted. Interestingly, 70% of the San diet was made up of plants that had been gathered. Overall, women supplied two to three times more food than the men. The San defined gender roles very clearly, but they made it clear that gender was no means to claim authority over anyone. Anthropologist James Suzman, who spent 25 years living with the San saw that if San couples married and one turned out to be violent, disloyal or simply annoying, then a divorce could easily be carried out without much social stigma. This gender equality amongst the San made sense for practical reasons. Men and women both played important roles in providing food. So it was obvious that when making decisions about when and where to camp, when to hunt, when to gather, when to have babies, both men and women should have a say in the decision. Most of this information was presented by Lee at the 1966 symposium Man the Hunter, which considering who provided the most food is pretty funny. This symposium questioned the belief that hunter-gatherer life was nasty, brutish and short. Because the San knew their environment so well, they happily survived in the same way for tens of thousands of years without fail. Gathering provided the bulk of their diet and hunting provided their favourite food, meat. But at first glance their hunting tools don't seem too impressive. If you look at a sand bow and arrow, you'd think you could barely kill a squirrel with it, and you'd be right. And if you look at the size of the animals the sand traditionally hunted, kudu, giraffes, wildebeests, they aren't small animals. Why didn't the sand invent larger, more powerful weapons? Well, they didn't need to. They had a secret weapon, poison. We have evidence from Border Cave in South Africa that shows ricin-based poisons that the sand rubbed on their arrows, which is about 25,000 years old. Poison doesn't really preserve like rocks or bones, so this find is incredibly lucky and the sand were probably using poison long before. But for at least 25,000 years, all a sand hunter had to do to guarantee a kill was get his arrow to hit his prey anywhere on the body. Work smarter, not harder. As soon as an arrow hit its mark, the weak shaft separates from the tiny arrowhead stuck in the animal. 
then all the hunter has to do is wait for the poison to finish the job for him. Creating a poison that can kill a large animal without turning the meat toxic is an impressive feat of chemistry, one that probably took a lot of fatal trial and error. Some sand groups use castor beans to make poison, others use plants, but the sand of the central and northern Kalahari found a uh, peculiar source. They gathered the tiny larvae of the Deamphidia beetle. The sand then carefully rolled the larvae between their fingers, softening them up, and then they popped off the heads and squeezed out their toxic insides onto their arrows. No one with cuts or scrapes is allowed to take part in this process, because there is no antidote for Deamphidia poison. You can kill a mouse with just 25 trillionths of a gram of this poison. And with this ingenious concoction combined with an ultra-light bow and arrow, the San could hunt with ease. The San's tracking skills are just as important as their poison arrows. In the endless Kalahari, it's essential to be able to track your prey over long distances. San hunters could tell the weight and amount of fat on an animal by looking at its tracks alone. They could tell an individual's tracks apart from the rest of the herd. By looking at scuffs on rocks and recently trampled grass, they could tell the direction of a fleeing animal. Gossip spread quickly in sand camps because people recognized each other's footprints and knew who was coming and going from where and when. Once a hunter had hit their prey with an arrow, they would simply memorize its tracks and let the poison do its job. Then in a couple of hours or the next day, they'd follow their tracks and pick up the meal. The poison has brought the wildebeest down on a dry pan. The hunt has been successful. Returning the camp with their kill, hunters would need thick skin, because back at camp, everyone would insult the meat, referring to it as tiny or barely even worth the effort of hunting. The hunters weren't supposed to be hurt by these fake insults. They normally smiled as they were dished out and just continued to distribute the meat equally to everyone. This was an act that every San knew well, and it served a vital purpose. It kept egos in check. If you read Richard Lee's study on the San, he gets super offended when they start making fun of an ox he bought them for Christmas. In frustration, he asks why they keep calling the fat ox he bought skinny and worthless. And a San man called Tomazeo responds, When a young man kills much meat, he comes to think of himself as a chief or a big man, and he thinks the rest of us as his servants or inferiors. We cannot accept this. So we always speak of his meat as worthless. This way, we cool his heart and make him gentle. The San understood letting anyone rise to the top of the social ladder led to problems. Everyone in the camp was on equal footing, and if some started thinking too much of themselves, the San made sure to ridicule them. This fierce equality that the San practiced helped them become the most stable population in human history. Genetic evidence suggests that up until 20,000 years ago, they were probably the most populous group of humans on Earth. They remain the most genetically diverse. This genetic diversity means that they have suffered fewer population bottlenecks than other peoples that migrated out of Africa. Bottlenecks like war, famine, and disease. The rest of humanity has lost over half its genetic diversity in the last 150,000 years. The San traditionally lived in small family groups that constantly moved around the Kalahari. But during the winter, some groups would meet up to form large social groups. These meetings were a great time for the San to engage in their favorite activity, gift giving. Most San had Hexaro or generosity partnerships. All Hexaro partners would frequently give each other gifts to reaffirm friendships. Gifts were always reciprocated, but never right away. Traditionally, the most popular gift items were ostrich eggshell jewelry and hunting tools. Although some San, when gifted an educational YouTube video, would immediately respond by liking, sharing, and subscribing to that San's channel. Such a beautiful concept. The San's ostrich eggshell jewelry is one of their most famous artistic creations. Other San art includes some of the thousands of drawings at the Tissodillo Hills going back thousands of years. And in recent years, some San have become accomplished artists. They also create a lot of music, which has a really nice beat to it. Here's a quick sample. Let's take a break from learning about deadly poison, awesome hunters, and ancient history. 
and instead take a look at something much, much sexier. Early 20th century British economists. John Maynard Keynes, in his 1930 essay, Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren, predicted that by 2030, advances in productivity and technology would give us a high quality of life while only working about 15 hours a week. Keynes was right about productivity. Offices are 84% more productive now than they were in 1970, and farms are 46% more productive. But Keynes was wrong about the 15-hour work week. He didn't consider our ability to consume and come up with new, unnecessary work. Like, what even is a front-facing customer satisfaction operator? What is my purpose? A full workday in 1970 can now be completed in an hour and a half, but we still work eight-hour days for some reason. Keynes thought technology would bring leisure. I wonder what he would have thought if he knew about the San, who have been working less than 15 hours a week for over 100,000 years. Gathering food is the San's top priority, but according to Lee, in all, the adults of the Dobie camp worked about two and a half days a week. Since the average working day was about six hours, the fact emerges that the Kung Bushmen of Dobi, despite their harsh environment, devote from 12 to 19 hours a week to getting food. This 12 to 19 hour work week netted the San about 2,140 calories per day. Now, Lee's studies are fascinating, but he did make some mistakes. For example, his work week did not take into account housework such as cleaning or childcare. This would bring the San's total up to about 40 hours compared to our 80 hours when housework is counted. Based on Lee's studies, anthropologist Marshall Salins dubbed the San the original affluent society. For Salins, there were two so everyone saw the video guys yes sir yes sir yes sir okay so i will share the link you know you can watch the entire video in this tiny you know 10 11 minutes that we saw there were topics that are related to so many parts of our syllabus so exiting this and coming back to our ppt so everyone can see the ppt Yes, sir. Okay. Economic anthropology. That is our topic today. So, so many things are there. Uh, now, after watching the, you know, video, what all things did you not notice? Can anyone tell me the things that you noticed? Gender Anything equality. That you okay. First. Just one second. I'll, just one second. No, no, no. Point the options. Okay. No. Actually, the place where I am right now, it is raining. No, it's not raining right now. It's actually rain has stopped, but the cold is so much. It's like almost three degrees right now. Okay. So my hands are raining. not in the best shape. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So can you see what I'm writing or is it too uh, thin? No, sir. It's okay. It's fine. Fine. So gender equality. Okay. My handwriting will be a little weird today because my hands are very cold. Gender equality is the one thing you noticed. What else did you notice in the video? Uh, that... Sorry. 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 Hunting, yeah. hunting gathering society. Hunting gathering society. Yes. It was a hunting gathering a type of economy, right? Hunting, gathering yes. economy. Hunting, gathering. Okay. What else? Reciprocate exchange. Reciprocal system of exchange. Recipro what was the reciprocal thing that you saw? Uh, sir, it's uh, that uh, ostrich excel and uh, yes, that gifting, that gifting, yeah, right? That gifting. Gifting. Yeah. That is a very important thing. We'll come to it. It's a very important thing. Yeah. Then, what else? Uh, uh, the they are eating about fifty-five percent more amount of protein yes. than recommended by WHO. Great. Yes, so uh, RDA, recommended daily allowance of uh, calories as well as proteins. Yes. Both, you know, they are eating way more than, you know, what is recommended while doing simple hunting gathering with less number of hours work than we do here yes, with much simpler technology, just a bow and arrow. And that too, Small. a very tiny bow and arrow. Yeah. Anything else you noticed? Yes, yeah, sir. Their, their knowledge about medicine, foods to eat, foods to avoid, and the poison they have done, yes. uh, they have made after hit and trial method. 
you know so you can say that that's not a simple technology at all that's quite yes, complex you know so the technology that they have you know the developing that poison that would have taken so many lives you know trial and error so it, 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 the, the author had shown it is in a very funny way you know it mm. tasting and they're just dying and all so trying to make a funny video but obviously so many people you know uh, would have died doing that yes what else so their it memory could... of going back to the pre yeah their memory of rememorizing you know just not not just a memory by looking at the trampled grass they can understand you know which way the animal has gone you know then their language is very unique yeah, yeah language that is something uh, yeah that is called clicking language okay hmm. clicking language so second sir bo- uh, how they have do not you, okay so this they, uh, he was using the word san for the tribe okay san yes sir he was using the word s a n san but that tribe's another name is this now i want someone to tell me how to pronounce this something Who's like that? this suraj <laughs> yeah suraj that's called kung this exclamation mark is a clicking sound okay so their entire language you saw that guy speaking you know so many clicks in his language yes sir okay so they are called kung tribe yeah hmm. next what else noticed uh, some one most important thing uh, just i have i was saying going to say i forgot I will say it just <laughs> okay. No issues. Anything else, guys? They, you noticed they could distributed the prey after uh, bringing it to home. They yes, distributed, sir. so sharing, right? Very important thing for today's class. Also, the hierarchy, yeah. hierarchy that they have not allowed hierarchy to be built. Yeah, they the they have not society. allowed hierarchy. The kind of equality and equity that they have, you know, the fierce equality, fierce, very fierce equality. They yes, will not sir. have any leader, any any. There will no bo- you know boss among them, right? one more is important thing sir that uh, mm-hmm. they have faced very few bottleneck uh, in their population that bottleneck their, yes sir so their bottleneck in which part of syllabus different. do we have this sir it's a synthetic theory i guess that no, part not synthetic theory yeah, yeah yeah it's related to synthetic theory basically yes, but population one uh, unit 9.3 of paper 1 okay okay you now where you have something yes. called as a uh, genetic drift yes sir So genetic drift in physical anthropology theory. biological anthropology yeah. so we will not study this in detail today we will study this hmm. any other points so women collecting uh, more number of, of yes women family. contributing more women yeah. contributing more okay women contributing more than men in economic activity yes so you guys have watched the video very carefully when i trust me when i watched the video for the first time i was not able to gather these many points so have you guys watched this video earlier Sir, no, sir. I have. I was knowing about this, but not watch oh, this video. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that, see, first of all, you no, know, able to gather so many points shows two things. First of all, your attentiveness. Second thing that you guys have some idea about your anthropology syllabus. That's why you are able to relate things. Okay. Now, just a tiny bit of video on YouTube, and we have so many points. Although we are going to study economic anthropology today, not everything is important for us today. But you know, if you watch this entire video. and more videos like this we'll have so many more examples that are not there in the book okay now some of the points that i want to discuss richard lee so the names of the you know anthropologists these are not there in any books okay but it should, it's very important richard lee's study of the san or the kung tribe okay regarding the calorie and protein intake intake very important it can be cited somewhere if especially where it can it be cited when you talk about different kinds of you know uh, economic activities hunting gathering agriculture so this shows that hunting gathering has the potential of providing more than agriculture so we should not consider agriculture as a developed form of economic activity hunting gathering has given better results in some cultures right james susman another one it was mentioned there okay he talked about the gender parity so very important when we study about you know uh, you know uh, other you know parts of the syllabus in, in in social chapter now why was there gender parity in this society so because because the contribution of more women was more than the of yes. men in sport yes so normally if you study you know uh, when we study um you know uh, in, in in sorry in this paper only uh, uh paper 1 in uh, residential rules rules of residence yes sir okay patriarchy rules, matriarchy uh, rules of residence patriliney matriliney yes, or uh, patrilocality matrilocality 
when you study the rules of residence as to after marriage where does the couple reside the couple resides with the fathers you know the boys family or the girls family there one of the reasons given for this by none other than ember and some other anthropologists is that whoever contributes more so you know if hunter gatherer societies if the hunters usually are given more status because they contribute more usually in most of hunt in most hunting gathering societies the hunters contribute more so most hunt, you know the hunters are male so society gives more importance to males and so the societies are patrilocal and after marriage the girl moves to the guy's family um so here it's not the case here the women are contributing more so women cannot be dominated and the men cannot say that we are more important and so so that is why what is happening is you know um there is gender parity you know, because the contribution is you know not you know, the men are not contributing more you can you know further think that why not matriline then when the women are contributing more but you know we will not get into that possibly you know that can be a question why not matriline when the women are contributing more but we will not get into that because today's discussion is regarding economic anthropology um then one thing i you know noticed uh, this name was there somewhere you should remember this you know this will help you not only in anthropology but in also in essay and all this person is a great sociologist uh, he's you know he sorry he's a you know someone in that you study in political science and he talks you know about early man's life being very bad early man before the state was created before government and state was created early man you know living in a stateless society life was short brutish and nasty you know people killing each other no food no life and but you know this video proves that thomas hobbes was wrong you know these guys the the sand tribe you know, for 100000 that is for 1 lakh years they have been living a very happy life and they faced all their difficulties after the state societies contacted them after the british and all you know look at the technology so simple yet so effective look at this thing the, you know the insulting the meat quantity howsoever big meat you take you know but they will insult why why were they insulting the meat quantity brought by anyone to enforce humility among the members yes great humility humility you know don't let success get into your head amazing things you know how societies devise these things bottlenecks it will be very important in unit 9.3 genetic drift you know you can use this example great example it's not there in any you know books frequent gifting frequent gifting what were they gifting uh, ostrich excel and, uh, and jewelry oh, and made of bones yeah bones. those kind of things yeah so one very important thing you know that the author in the uh, video said that gifts always reciprocated gifts are always reciprocated what what is the meaning sir matlab jo hum log denge wo wapas milega but turant nahi maybe next time yes so very important thing gifts are always reciprocated when i am gifting you something you will gift me something but not but never right away so i am giving you you will not give me right away i am giving you a gift so there will be an expectation that i have gifted you i will get it sometime sometime you know later i will get it that is one thing first expectation that i will get it i will get back not now sometime later but i will get back second expectation is a second thing is there there is, there is no you know expectation of value parity no expectation of exact value parity so if i have given you you know two pieces of jewelry of ostrich excel i do not expect that you will give me two i don't want you know less you have to give me at least two that th kind of thing is not there i have gifted you ostrich excel you know you can give me gift me bone uh, bow and arrow you know, th their values cannot be compared you know they are not in monetary terms they are not talking to be exactly the same you know that happens in today's modern economy if i am giving you 10 rupees i want something from the shopkeeper which is exactly of the value of 10 rupees if i get less i will not like it he will not give me more no i will not take less so we want this value parity but in simple societies in simple exchanges though that value parity is not there in complex societies also we have we have some example for example 
in marriage we often get some gifts you know so in marriage we often get some gifts so someone has gifted me an envelope with 101 rupees someone has gifted me an envelope with 501 rupees we remember who has gifted us what in my marriage why do we remember it and this is noted down that which family gave how much why is this noted down to reciprocate when they are it is noted down to reciprocate that when we are invited in their family's marriage we have to keep in mind that they had gifted us 101 and 501 who has gifted 101 who had gifted 501 it's not that we'll give something exactly of the value as 101 no but we have to keep in mind that someone had given a lesser value or higher value so i will have to give something more valuable to him and something less valuable to him but the exact monetary value will not be same as what i got not exactly 101 not exactly 501 so this thing another thing is i got gift today in my marriage i may be gifting him 5 years later again reciprocated but not right away this is an amazing example of something that we'll study in the coming classes what is it suraj what is it called this kind of uh, not actually able to recall the perfect anyone generalized, anyone generalized great yeah who is that generalized system of namrata the... yes namrata generalized reciprocity yes. so those who guys those guys you know who are reading the books all the standard books you would have read about generalized reciprocity or you will read about generalized reciprocity yes. but have any one of you come across this example about the san or the kung for reciprocity Sir, i have read about this example yes so you have read about but i think that is an exception anyone else has who has read about this in some book no sir no so you can note down this as a beautiful example which will be unique right okay he talked about someone called as john menard keynes who is this guy economist hmm. which country's economist <laughs> uk is a economist usa okay usa okay. he's very important for two things his this guy was mentioned here he was mentioned that he said you know he had predicted why was this guy mentioned in this video uh, for productivity increase of productivity so he had predicted that in the coming years man will be so advanced in technology that productivity will go up sharply and number of hours required will go down so we'll be working very less number of hours but but productivity will be very high so he was right partially because productivity has gone up but number of hours has not gone down so that is what the video said right i will tell you two more things about this guy jm kens anyone with economy you know who has studied e economics in detail earlier no sir me but yes but for okay. upsc not as an optional okay anyone who has studied world history very in detail sir that also i have studied so where have you come across across this guy in either of them john menard yes sir i have read read about this anyone anyone can answer so guys you know again like you know i i keep telling in every class no replies on the chat you know because i i somehow i'm not able to see the chat during the class even i'm sharing my screen so if anyone wants to give me an answer it has to be a verbal vocal answer so anyone can tell me john menard keynes where else have you read about him sir global depression of uh, the of, economy of which year 2008 no 1928 sure. no way 1928 no, no 1928 the previous yeah, one 1930s. 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 Ah, yeah. 1930s yeah ah yeah so the great depression of 1930s john menard keynes is related to it but why how is it related to it don't google if you know he was the one who actually revived the economy by uh, increasing the like expansionary policy great so that's why expansionary poli policy so you know what happens when the economy is in a downturn then there is a you know massive downturn then often what governments do is they start spending more they start building roads even when a road is not required that bad they start building bridges even when it is not they start sending money to capital people capital investment you know cap capital investment you know uh, so this is called keynesian economics because john menard keynes asked the us president of that time you know to start doing that he said that please start spending more money you know bring down uh, that uh, so it bank is called rate. yeah keynesian economics so 
one more thing where john menard keynes is important i talked talked about world history anyone can can anyone recall where where do, does he appear in world history a recommendation of establishment of central bank i guess okay i i, I have not read about what i have read is what happened in 1914 world war okay who lost germany and ottoman empire so what was the, what was done with germany after that uh, bifurcation it's broken into west and east anyone knows about this versailles versailles yes. treaty of treaty of versailles, versailles. yes and they were asked to pay indemnity Fine. of pound 6600 million okay yes they were asked mm-hmm. to pay an indemnity of pound 6600 million later they could not pay it but there was one economist when when this meeting was happening you know for versailles as to what should be the punishment of germany when this 6600 million pounds was suggested one economist was very angry and he walked out of the meeting he was john menard keynes of usa he said that this is going to bring the second world war if you ask yeah, germany okay. if you push germany to pay this much this is going to ruin germany and this will bring second world war so hitler later cited this kind of uh, treaty as a reason for starting second world war right yes sir so men kenard is uh, keynes is important there as well fine coming back to anthropology you know so this kind of information that i provide in the class which is not directly related to anthropology you can use somewhere else you can use in an essay or somewhere right okay can you guys see me is my video on i think the video is not on no sir we can't see you. can you see me now yes, it's very cold very <laughs> can't recognize Extremely you really cold yeah you know because i am someone who don't feel cold usually you know people tell you know me yaar ki this is a up ka guy and the up people don't feel cold but when the temperature is 3 degrees you have to feel cold <laughs> okay okay so coming to uh, this uh, thing yeah another important point that i noticed was you know that the agriculture did not spread because okay oh, no no so this, this you know i i think i stopped the video before this in this video uh, the author says that you know agriculture did not spread to other cultures because it was desired or the other cultures wanted to adopt it it was because you know the ones that were doing agriculture were able to defeat the hunting gathering cultures and they imposed their system of ag- agriculture so this actually shows that hunting gathering societies everywhere did not want to adopt agriculture Ag- agriculture should not be seen as a higher level of economic production which everyone would want oh ho oh, let's also you know start doing agriculture not like that because we have seen here that hunting gathering societies were better off right they were getting more calories so in lot of in many parts of the world agriculture spread not because of willingly people adopting it but because agricultural societies being able to defeat the non agricultural ones and imposing their system of agriculture this is what we see in this video later okay now starting today's discussion this is a very important phrase we are what we eat yes sir how do you explain this can anyone explain this to me i can sir yeah suresh tell me sir it's uh, regarding what you eat for example if you eat junk food then your body will and your immunity will be on the weaker side fine and if if someone goes for in for clean food with amount of calorie which they can take in so their body will be literally slim and more fit so that is what i was expecting i was expecting a literal scientific meaning what we what you know what uh, we are what we eat whatever we eat makes our body so good food healthy food and all those things but for anthropology there is a different meaning in anthropology okay anyone else wants to take a guess is it regarding hunting gathering and agriculture exactly part? the okay. thing is what we eat here eat doesn't mean simply eating eating means economy subsistence okay subsistence okay end of the day all activities for eating only yeah now we have a lot of things you know pubg is not helping you eat but someone is eating <laughs> because you are playing pubg yes sir basically all activities you know in simple societies are gathered towards getting food so eating basically means your economic level of the society we are what we eat it simply means that our economy eating eating equals to 
eating equals to economy because economy is you know geared to get food and economy determines everything else so economy determines everything else this is what i'm trying to say this is similar to something called economic determinism or in our syllabus cultural materialism anyone has read about cultural materialism yes sir name of the scholar who talked about cultural materialism whose theory is it anyone guys quickly I have to revise, sir. That theory. Can part. you see my screen? Yes, Marvin Harris. Okay, Marvin Harris. Harris. Okay, Marvin Harris. So, Marvin Harris talks about cultural materialism. He also says that economy determines everything else. I think I have discussed this example earlier. I will discuss again. There is a, you know, a tribe, a Polynesian tribe, not Melanesian, Polynesian tribe. The name is. Mm. The name is. I'm forgetting the name. Okay, so that tribe has scarcity of food. The island where they live is not very fertile, and they have scarcity of food. Okay, scarcity of food is a patriarchal society. So scarcity of food translates into, you know, they feeling that let's have lesser people. so what to do kill the female children female infanticide is practiced there female infanticide leads to lesser women a uh, poor male female ratio because of which happens polyandry one woman has several husbands like this okay polyandry now because of this polyandry in that island typically you know this woman entire day goes in uh, upkeep i mean she tries to maintain herself in her best prime looks so that you know she can keep all her four husbands happy so in that society most of the time of the you know women is spent you know taking care of the husbands because of which who is ignored the children, children are ignored children are ignored the children are ignored in that society usually these children grow up without mother's care grow up angry and with lot of resentment towards father women in general and mothers in particular now this is the trend in that culture now to justify this anger towards the women what the society has done all the mythology all the mythology like we have ramayan mahabharat their mythology in that island all their stories all their you know uh, fairy tales and everything they revolve around women being the villains in all those societies all those you know their uh, epics and all those mythology women are shown as you know someone who steals children's food who kills children they drink the blood of the children you know they are shown as all the kind of negative stuff so here marvin harris this is an awesome example for marvin harris uh uh you know cultural materialism at the base is the economic thing economy is about scarcity of food here right they have scarcity of food so that is the base that is the base because of this economic scarcity other things are happening that are on the top and at that very top is their mythology and stuff which justifies whatever is happening infrastructure structure superstructure this is what he had talked about we'll come into this we'll come into this later in much in much more detail so this is one example okay how we can see that economy determines everything and we can say that we are what we eat okay moving on we are to discuss economic anthropology today everyone is following everything so far as of now yes, sir okay anyone has any problems anyone who is not able to follow anything anyone guys 
having any problem with any topic that we discussed so far no okay yes, sir right so economic anthropology just one second yes can you hear me guys yes sir okay yeah so after all this background that i built up you know about how important is economy in um, all the societies and how economy determines everything and uh, you know we also saw example of a primitive tribe which will keep on citing again and again lot of things that we discussed in that you know uh, um san tribes will keep on you know coming back you know in our discussion again and again so Maldinowski is considered the father of economic anthropology. Maldinowski, Bronislaw Maldinowski is considered the father of economic anthropology. Okay, uh, so we have to mention him in the you know very first slide when we're talking about economic anthropology. So now the question is, how well do you know Bronislaw Maldinowski? So as I said, father of anthropology. So you all definitely would have known the gender by now. Nationality. What is the nationality of Maldinowski? Germany. No. Poland, Please, sir. Guys, you will not Google. Okay, no one will Google in the class. Yeah. Poland. Polish. Polish. Okay. Not only Polish. From Polish, he became English because he became oh. a citizen of England. And then, later on, he moved on to America, yes. and he died in USA. Is buried in USA. He was a Polish guy. So it's a very interesting thing. He was a Polish guy, studying physics and maths. Gets interested in, you know, studying tribes by reading a book written by someone. I had told in the class. Remember? R. C. Brown. No, no, no. R. C. No. Brown and Malinowski both got interested in anthropology by reading a book. After reading a book. No, Fraser. 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 Fraser's book. What? What was the book? The Golden Bough. The, the, the Golden, golden Bough. Bow. Great. Yes. You know, the Golden mm -hmm. Bough of Fraser. After reading this book, you know, uh. these guys got so interested that they left their uh, science and everything and they started you know uh, studying primitive tribes so you know out of the interest of primitive tribes he comes to uh, study uh, the tribes in australia australian aborigines what is the time period around this time when he comes to australia anyone rough guess uh, 1914 1914 great so what is happening in 1914 In other world parts war. of the they world, they were stuck there because of uh, world okay. war. And so world war, war began. World war began. This guy, he is a Polish guy, and by then, in that time, back then, Poland was not a country. Poland was divided among different countries. Different countries had, you know, uh, uh, torn apart Poland. Poland in different parts. So the part of Poland where, from where, you know, uh, Malinowski belonged, was under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Austrian Empire. Habsburg. So basically, it's Habsburg Empire. Back then, Habsburg Empire basically is the empire that was fighting France and England in World War One. He is in Australia. Australia is, is under the control of Britain. England. Yes. Okay. So he is in Australia, and he is a citizen of Habsburg Empire. Habsburg and Britain are fighting against each other in the World War. So he is an enemy alien in the term of Polity Lakshmi Kant. he is an enemy alien he is from an enemy country so he is detained he cannot leave australia but later you know the british authorities realize that he is no not a harmful guy he is a scholar he wants to study so they allow him to go here and there and study so he starts his study and he goes to different islands near australia one of them what was the name of the island where he went went 
Tro brand islands, right? Not Tro brand. Tro brand. Tro brand. Okay, yeah. Tro brand. Yeah. So you should, you know, look through where look up Tro brand where it is. It is very near. You know, it's it's part of the New Guinea near Australia. So we went to this island. Okay. So this island will be Melanesia or Polynesia? Is it Melanesia or Polynesia? Melanesia. Melanesia. Very important. You should know what is Melanesia, what is Polynesia. Melanesia, melanin, melanin. Normally they are dark. And the Polynesians are normally Europeans like white, okay. but they are all located in 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 Pacific. So Melanesian island of Trobriand. He went. He studied. He started studying there. And often, you know, in his personal diaries, he uh, expresses the anguish and anger of being stuck away from. He loved his mother. He loved his mother a lot. But he was not able to go back to you know Poland to meet his mother, and he was very you know uh, frustrated and ang you know anguish that am I going to die here itself, you know all that you know he's wrote in his personal diaries. I'll share a video about Malinowski. If some guys would have seen it, some guys may not have seen it. Those who have yes, not sir. seen it, now I'll share it. A beautiful video, you know. So if you know about these you know, scholars, some background about their lives and all, you know you are, you are more able to relate to these you know characters. and they are like your characters in your story and you are able to understand them better and write better answers they don't remain you know simple words in your books you can visualize them when you read about them okay so that's why knowing our main you know uh, heroes in our anthropology is very important one of them is malinowski so what are his important studies we already saw he went to trobriand when did he go we already saw 1914 1914 to 1918 where melanesia Trobriand, why was he stuck? We also saw that. What was the name of his book? What was the name of his book? Argonauts of Western Pacific. The Argonauts of Western Western Pacific, nineteen twenty-two. Okay, we will see that. So that is some check on your knowledge regarding Malinowski. So Malinowski began economic anthropology, you know, because he started studying the uh, exchanges among exchanges among the Trobrianders. One of them was Kula Ring, the Kula Exchange. Kula we'll study Ring. that. Yeah, yeah. K U L A Kula. Yes. Kula Exchange. We'll study that. It's very important thing. But after Malinowski had started economic anthropology, there was someone called Karl Polanyi. Karl Polanyi. Uh, this guy is one who, in his book Great Transformation. began something you know that started taking economic anthropology away from economics so economic anthropology since it is economic people used to think that economic anthropology will be very similar to economics but this guy's work started showing that no economic anthropology has nothing to do with economics and it's very different from economics it is totally different and that is what what and you know he began something called the formalism versus substantivism debate yes sir we'll discuss this later so this karl polanyi's book the great transformation is very important from where it, you know economic anthropology diversified and went and moved away and diverged from economics and what began was the formalism versus substantivism debate we'll come into this debate scope of economic anthropology what all we are going to study in economic anthropology one very important thing here guys in your upsc mains exam if you get a question regarding scope of anthropology so what will the answer be what all things you will write pardon sir scope of anthropology question, scope of anthropology so we have to take in uh, respect of all the branches of anthropology yeah. for example scope basically means all the four biology. branches okay yes the four branches my suggestion is if you can you know attempt some other question you know because options are available then do not attempt this question scope of anthropology please try to avoid the reason for that is anthropology as a whole the scope is so massive so yeah. huge and keep you know new things are going on getting added every day every day you know you have forensic things you know forensic coming under yes, anthropology you know nutrition anthropology nutrition kin anthropometry sports you know new discoveries in genetics that show you know that you know there are some kind of you know uh, genes that help in you know uh, 100 meter sprint 
and there is another gene that helps in uh, a, a 40 km marathon yes sir so many things are going on adding every day you know so whatever the answer you write how so you know howsoever good answer you write the examiner will never be impressed and he will always feel that something is lacking so try to avoid this but if the question is regarding the scope of economic anthropology scope of political anthropology scope of linguistic anthropology please do That's attempt them one. you know because the scope of these is very short whatever is mentioned in our syllabus that itself is the scope of economic anthropology whatever is mentioned in our syllabus is the scope of political anthropology so if if we take a specific branch a small branch and talk about the scope it is much easier to answer and you will be able to write good answers theek hai so scope of economic anthropology means what all things we come across when we study economic anthropology so basically we study about how societies produce their food or produce their you know whatever uh, products and resources how do they consume it and how do they distribute and redistribute it among themselves the special focus of our uh, this uh, subject is on this third portion redistribution maximum focus is on redistribution how the redistribution happens we'll come across very important concepts like reciprocity redistribution market ceremonial exchange sharing etc now name some tribes that you know everyone can participate some tribes that you know so the tribe toda tribe san tribe toda okay san tribe munda fine munda ho oh. asur ho oh. and asur and the manis chenchu very good and the manis and the manis and sentinels sentinels and kirula onge Onges, Kirula, and Balian. Oh, Samoan tribe. What? Gaddi. Balian. Gaddi. Balian. Yes. Samoan tribe, sir. Gaddi. Samoa. Gaddi. Okay, fine. Bushmen. Uh, no. Yeah. But what we'll do is we'll only talk about the Indian tribes right now. for this slide so just one second guys okay now who said todas who gave the example of todas suraj suraj tell me suraj where do i locate them nilgiri okay who gave the example of mundas sir me suraj yes suraj. Uh, tell me jharkhand jharkhand bihar chatisgarh odisha yeah. so It's mundas ho also ho so, asur munda ho asur fine chenchus who gave yeah. the example yeah Telangana. where tilangana okay chenchus okay andaman is the name says it sentinel is where where sentinel is andaman andaman lower andaman that is middle and andaman there is a sentinel island yes sentinel north basically north sentinel island it's called yes, north sir. sentinel island onges same uh, अंडमान निकोबार ओनली ठीक है इरुला नीलगिरी इरुला इज सम नीलगिरी इरुला एंड टोडा दे हैव रेसिप्रोकल एक्सचेंज गद्दीस सर हिमाचल हिमाचल सर ओके बंजारा आल्सो सर ओके नाउ गद्दीस व्हाट काइंड ऑफ इकोनॉमी डू दे हैव What is their main economic activity? 
transhumans transhumans oh, this is a good word that you have given me can you give a simpler word i will can you give a simpler meaning? word for that actual meaning of that sir nomadic I'll, i'll tell you i'll tell you nomadic can we say pastoral yes pastoral is toda gaddi so so are gaddi is not pastoral suraj yes sir yes sir yes sir yes they are also so toda is also pastoral what about the irulas Irula, irulas sir uh, they are i think uh, they are snake catchers they are snake catchers yes so they are very good in snake catching what 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 would be their economy basically okay let's Let come us. to chenchu chenchu chenchu's economic activity chenchu what do, what do chenchu specialize in guys hunting gathering hunting gathering mundas primitive agriculture Sustainable. agriculture they are agriculturists okay so basically very good i mean uh, most of you guys have given exactly correct you know so this was just a brief exercise to see if you know about different types of economic activities now i want to explain this transhumans who talked about it in the class who said transhumans navinodini yeah vinodini would you like to explain it to the class oh uh, yes sir with an uh, example during the uh, sir actually during the uh, winter season mm -hmm. uh, uh, they migrate to the plains uh during the summer season uh, they actually take their herds for uh, grazing purpose uh, to the uh, higher peaks of the mountains yes examples uh gaddis only sir i'm not aware gaddi bakarwal like these yeah. these gaddis and bakarwals and bhutias of uh, himachal uttarakhand and ladakh even the changpas you know about changpa yes sir where are they located uh, kashmir wool not kashmir i guess ladakh is in ladakh okay. ladakh the disputed part of india china not yes. the eastern ladakh that is where they are located they rear a goat that is called the changthangi yes sir wool are very warm of yeah, that yeah the wool is very good yeah so now the thing is transhumans as vinodini explained uh, suraj are you very able to understand transhumans uh, yes sir transhumans the pra practice of you know the a uh, pastoralist coming down in the plains during the colder times with their herd and then migrating again you know in the summer upwards you know because better grass is available you know in the upper stretches in the winter in the summer so in the summer they go up in the altitude and in the winter they come down this they do every year this is called transhumans okay All right so we talked about you know economic anthropology talking about production consumption redistribution consumption is not very important for us production is but the most important part is redistribution but we'll start with the production part how do the societies produce their resources and their food so if these are the different kinds of economic activities the major ones hunting gathering and then after hunting gathering the next thing is fishing some of the tribes only do hunting gathering some of them add fishing to it hunting gathering and fishing swedening okay we'll come to it one by one so hunting gathering also called as foraging examples hadza which country hadza um, kenya kenya in africa they are hunter gatherers hadza one very interesting thing about hadza is their language the hadza language has no word for the feeling of worry they don't have a word for worry what does this show about the hadza uh, they are uh, free and motivated they are carefree moment. they don't worry yes sir because you know our vocabulary revolves around what we experience around us so they don't have this word someone pronounce this tribe's name kung great you have to you know keep you know doing that kung so this tribe is also hunting gathering where where will you find them uh, africa uh, sir uh, what uh, that kalahari region. kalahari they are nothing but Kal the bushmen of kalahari that we studied in geography yes, chenchu where to find them 
Telangana. 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 Okay, so these are the examples. Yeah. Coming to fishing. Nicobar is where will you find no issues? Andaman that... Nicobar. Yeah. Ainu. Not Andaman Nicobar. In Nicobar, part of Andaman Nicobar. Okay. okay. The Nicobaris are in Nicobar only. They don't they are not found in Andaman. Okay. The, the upper islands. They are only found in the lower islands. Okay. Ainus. Where will you find them? No idea. Anyone? Don't no one will Google. Just try to guess. I know. So Japan. Who is that? Japan. Vinodini. Ah yes, sir. Very good, Vinodini. This is Japan. So how did you come across this tribe, uh, Vinodini? Where did you read about them? I have read in this book, sir. Uh, Brain tree. Brain tree. Yeah. So these Ainus. So so obviously, did the book mention about the Ainus in Japan, or did you Google after seeing Ainu that where are they found? No, no, sir. It is written there. I know, sir, from Japan. Okay. So in even economic. If it is not culture. mentioned, even if it is not mentioned, I will, you know, suggest whenever you read about something which you are not aware where they are located, do Google about them, okay, and note it down there. The more you know about them, the more it will be easier to memorize. So Ainus of Japan, they are found in the northern islands of Japan where they are you know, specialized in fishing. Where will you find this tribe? The other Kula ring. Ah, no, no. Portlatch. No, no, no. Portlatch. Port yeah. Port Where will you find them? Coquitul. Uh, uh, Africa. North America. No. North Very America. Good. North America, Canada. Okay. okay. So basically, uh. they they this they are spread across. Uh, you know the. So so if this is say for example. Is it near Alaska region? Yeah, yeah. So this is North America. Somewhere here is the. So this is Mexico. This is USA, and this is Canada. So they are found somewhere here, partly in USA, partly in Canada, or stretching all the way to Alaska. So this is where they are found. This part is called British Columbia. Okay. So this British Columbia, you find this Quaquitul tribe. They will keep on coming again and again. You know when we read about them, who studied them? Sir, R.C. Brown, I think. No. Who studied them in lot of detail? The great, great Boas. Okay, Bo Franz Boas. Yes, sir. Franz Boas not only studied about you know their uh, economy. He studied about their symbols, their dance, their language, their gestures. You know the uh, wooden pillars that they erect for their dead ancestors. Yes, sir. The Kwakiutl. Okay. So yeah, so they are you no, know, they specialize in fishing. Swedening. What is the meaning of swedening? That swing, swing, I guess, swing part. Swing. Making, that making clothes and all. No, no, no way. No. How do you get food by making clothes? No, swedening. Anyone else will try what is swedening without googling? Removing skin. Have you heard about slash and burn? Okay, yes, sir. Slash and burn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So basically, shifting cultivation. Okay. Yes. Sir. So sh mm -hmm. shifting cultivation is also a type of economic activity. That is called swedening. Okay, shifting cultivation. Zoom. Zoom. So the examples. Khasi. Where you do you find them? Nilgiri. Meghalaya. Khasi, Nilgiri. No, no. Sir, not expected from you. Sorry, sir. Meghalaya, sir. Meghalaya. Other tribes in Meghalaya, apart from Khasi? Garo, Garo Jentia. Hmm. Garo yeah. Khasi Jentia. Yeah. So yeah. Khasi are in Meghalaya and they are, they follow this, you know, shifting cultivation. Dongria Khond, where will you find them? Uh, is it Kashmir, sir? No way. <laughs> <It's Gujarat laughs> about, Rajasthan. You know, so you got confused with this word Dongria, you know, with the those who speak the Dongri language. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, they are found Rajasthan, in Himachal and Kashmir. Uh, they are found basically in Jammu, but they are Dogras. That is a different thing. Okay. Dongria okay. Khond will be found in Orissa. Okay, Orissa. They are a very popular tribe. They are very popular because they are possibly the only tribe, you know, that fought and won against a massive corporation, Vedanta. Vedanta wanted to take away their Hills. Oh, yes, to sir. Yes, sir. To mine bauxite. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They were able to defeat that, you know. So they are very, very important. And they will also come again and again when we study Indian anthropology. Okay. 
and many tribes in Amazon and Southeast Asia, they practice this slash and burn. Pastoralism. Rearing, rearing, uh, you know, rearing herds of animals. Nuer, where will you find them? Africa. Africa. Basically, Eastern Africa. Dinka. They are very similar. They are found nearby, you know, Tanzania, Kenya, Nuer, Dinka, both. Bakarwals. Himachal, Uttarakhand. Yes, Himachal, Uttarakhand. Same. Gaddi, same. Todas. Toda, Nilgiri. Yeah, so Suraj's favorite is Toda. He yes, cites Toda for everything and Nilgiri for everything. Okay. Bedouins. Where will you find Bedouins? Australia. No, no, no. no. Bedouins. Middle Anyone? East, in the Middle East. Middle Sir, East. Are... The Arab, Arab lands. You know, the, 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 the Arab lands doesn't mean basically Middle East, all, only Sahara also. So, in Sahara. You, so, you have seen this, you know, movie. Uh, any part of mummy or mummy returns. Yes, sir. There is a you know group, uh, you know the friend of the hero who comes on the camel mm. to save him. Uh, in the sands and all, they come in the sand desert. Have you seen? Anyone yes, remember? Sir. Sir? Yes, sir. They are Bedouins. You know they they spend spend their entire life on the back of the camel. Camel is their everything. You know they they are born with the camel, they die with the camel. Their food, their meat, their clothes, you know everything. They comes from bed, uh, camel only and what they cannot get from the camel, they exchange the camel products with other tribes to get other things like guns and all. Bedouins, they are also pastoralists. Their main animal is camel. camel. What, what is the main animal of Todas? Uh, sir, buffalo. Buffalo. The main an animal of Nuer? Oh, I guess. Wild buffalo. Oh. No. Main animal of Maasai? The main animal that is reared by Maasai? Cow. 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 Okay. Very important. They value the cow a lot. We'll see that when we see, you know, the market economy uh, in this, this class only. Not in today's class. Maybe it will not happen in today's class. The Changpas. Changpas rear what? Changthangi goat. It's a goat, yeah. Transhumans. I had mentioned here. Yes. So, in a way, Vinodini, you know, preempted what I have written in the slide. Transhumans. This is also called pastoralism or transhumans. Horticulture, next type of you know economic activity. Examples: throw brianders. Now, by horticulture, what do you mean by horticulture? If I ask anyone, cultivation of fruits and vegetables. Fruits. Yes, but that is the modern, you know, definition of horticulture as per as per human geography that we study. But cultivation without the use of plants. Yes, but when we talk about you know the primitive societies following hortic horticulture. It is not that fruits and flowers and vegetables, you know, that is sold in the market. No, that is not horticulture. Horticulture, when we talk about simple societies, is very simplest form of agriculture. You know, around their house, around their house, they will have small garden, like, you know, where they will grow some vegetables and some small crops without using any, you know, massive tools and stuff. Horticulture is very small scale agriculture, small scale agriculture. Mostly the tribes, you know, grow some, uh, maybe, you know, one kind of, uh, tube, tubers, like, you know, they grow maybe uh, yam. Yam or any such, you know, root crop in, in the backyard. And, you know, uh, that is all that they grow very, you know, on a very small scale. That is horticulture. It is a primitive agriculture, which later, later graduated to full scale agriculture. So horticulturists, throw brianders, studied by? Who that studied throw brianders? Malinowski. Malinowski. Where are they located? New Guinea. New Guinea. Near New Guinea, Melanesia. Yeah. Yano Mamo. Where would you Africa. find this tribe? Africa. No. Not Africa. at all, Suraj. No. So he, Don't go by the name. Gold Don't one. go by the name. Gold part, that gold blood. Yes. Bleeding gold. Yeah. But where? Sir, Kenya. No. South America. Okay, South America. Yeah. They are Amazonian tribe. Mm -hmm. Okay, Yano Mamo. Very important tribe. They are horticulturists. They have small gardens around their homes. Sembaga. I have mentioned already Melanesia. Mm -hmm. Sembaga. Sembaga is a very important, you know, uh, I will talk about them later in the class. Sembaga. The Sembagas, they have small gardens and they are a mixture of, you can say, um, 
horticulturist and pastoralist so they have small gardens and they also have a lot of pigs and there's a clash between the pigs and the gardening and then something happens what they do and then they kill all the pigs and they have a big feast <laughs> we study about it. very funny it is you know what what is it suraj sir the name i guess is postland that uh, no this, this is not this feast. is not potlatch no there's not potlatch is something else what they do is it is called the pig fest okay. the sembaga pig fest we'll study about it it is similar to potlatch but not exactly potlatch tribes who follow agriculture example munda ho orao we know where they are and then the last and the most you know advanced economic production is industrial production when the food is produced in the industries you know your your canned food you know coming in you are eating tuna but it is you know inside a can you are eating you know corn but it is also inside a can so the you know industrial production of food so that is the these are the basic you know economic activities we discuss some examples and we have to know their locations so if a question comes you can draw a map and show their locations as we move from hunting gathering cultures to pastoralists to horticulturists to agriculturists to industrialized societies these things change these are the main things that change the notion of private property starts appearing and becoming stronger and stronger and stronger so tribes like hadza in their vocabulary there is no word that translates to have in english why so because they treat everything of a community not of single person because they don't have anything they have no concept of someone owning anything no concept of ownership whatever is belongs to everyone no one singly owns anything so there is no concept of having this is my i have this land their their vocab doesn't have that word possibly in coming centuries you know as they because of the contact with outside world you know they also have the concept of private property possibly their vocabulary will change and this word will word will be added right so the initial original human communities they never had this concept of private property gradually when people you know moved to agriculture in the neolithic age so land became important you know because agriculture will happen where it will happen on land and then people started erecting fences around their land this is my land you know inside this fence is mine outside is yours and then when this ha started happening disputes fightings to solve the dispute there are some leaders are required feudalism some political leaders are required and this is the beginning of state gradually moving towards state you know king chiefdom and then state all those kind of things so private property concept as we move from hunting gathering to uh, today's agriculture you know today's uh, industrialized societies individualism in the primitive you know societies individual is not very important the entire community is important you know to some extent this 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 individualism the uh, you know ignorance of individualism not giving importance to individualism is present in our traditional societies also for example in the traditional hindu society in a village you know if someone wants to do this you know falls in love with someone and wants to get married what what is the typical response of the parents kill them no no not every parent says that what they will say what will not the allow. world say societal pressure what will the society say no don't do it what will the society say so here this individual who wants to you know get married this individual's choice is not important but what is society feels is more important what will the society say we still have it is right even now people say like that correct right or wrong yes, societal norms so so this shows you know that society being giving more you know given more importance than the individual this individualism has gradually become more important and societal you know opinion less important in a country say for example usa you know for the western world you know it doesn't matter what your neighbor feels or whoever feels to help with them 
you know whatever i feel i will do right so this is called the importance of individualism this also gradually you know so when everyone is equal in 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 a tribal hunting gathering band everyone is equal but gradually when agriculture began there was surplus so when there is surplus so much food is available that everyone doesn't need to do the same economic activity someone starts doing something else someone starts you know maybe painting someone starts making metal tools someone starts making music and everyone you know everyone is doing different profession and professions are graded as upper good profession bad profession upper lower poor you know dirty profession clean profession depending on their profession people become more important the individual who is doing that profession is more important than the individual who is doing the other profession you know so gradually when the society is move from one economic stage to other economic stage individualism appears individuals become more important rather than the society as a whole right yes or no okay and then surplus what is the meaning of surplus excess 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 when do we have surplus give me some examples surplus i mean some have, some examples yeah tell when me when we have maximum production maximum production i'll give you one small example so i'll make a, a very poor kind of a diagram of india because there is not much space so for example this is india okay here is somewhere magadh was located magadh read in history about magadh guys read or not yes yes sir and this was the vedic aryan land the you know where the vedic uh, thing was in hold i mean vedic uh, rituals were very important the northwestern india the brahmanical land so here wet rice cultivation wet paddy cultivation was invented here wet paddy cultivation what is wet paddy cultivation paddy is grown in a water always in a standing water yeah so you see you know if you see in uh, andhra pradesh in tamil nadu in west bengal in assam telangana how they grow rice yeah you'll see how they grow the rice you know they will first uh, just scatter the seeds and when the saplings come out they pluck the saplings they make a bundle of it and then they put the bundle in a field and then they you know uh, flood the field with water it stays in water for 7 8 9 10 days and lot of methane comes out and the paddy fields of you know india are the biggest source of methane you know that right everyone knows yes, that sir. yes sir yes, yes, yes source of you know methane yeah. mm. so that that is called paddy cultivation wet paddy cultivation magadh started doing wet paddy cultivation in 6th century bc around that time but in northwestern part of india paddy cultivation was still not popular people were mostly eating white uh, sorry wheat wheat and barley very less rice and simply scattering them you know because water was scarce water was not as much in abundance as in the eastern part so because of wet paddy cultivation more rice cultivated in this eastern region and on top of that very weak vedic hold weak vedic rituals hold means people were not doing yagna and havan every other day not you know so what happened in havan in the northwest india is people were burning lot of grain they were you know offering the grain to the gods putting it in the swaha in the fire have you seen that every anyone seen any yes, any, any yes, yeah you see. so that was not happening you know because in 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 eastern india the hold of vedic you know vedic civilization was not very strong and because of this you know them not following vedic rituals often the brahmanical sources of northwestern india call the kings of magadh the nandas and the mauryas as shudras so that is a different point altogether but because of several factors you know they are producing more rice and they are not burning it in their yagnas so they are having more rice now what now the what the king can do is the king can you know ask everyone to pay their surplus to him you know give that to you know to me as a tax the king is able to collect lot lot of surplus from that surplus he is able to hire lot of armies where to whom he can pay salaries by you know paying them grain salary in grain so he has a standing army he has a bureaucracy to collect tax he has everything that the north western india doesn't have and a stronger state comes out from here and it gobbles up entire india in the next 300 years so that is what surplus does understood one small example of surplus 
understood or not guys yes sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. another example you know indus valley civilization because they were able to tame the waters of indus they were able to do good agriculture agricultural surplus so you know there were many more professions everyone did not need to do agriculture someone was making seals someone was making bricks of uniform shape someone was making stone tools someone was making you know uh, bronze stuff so people were doing lot of other things other than agriculture because of surplus so that is what surplus does you know these three changes cause many more these three changes cause many more other changes like coming of political structures as we see in magadh you know a state structure comes up religion why religion will come with surplus how religion comes with surplus anyone so, any guess dandakshina the dandakshina comes when religion is already there how religion okay. will begin will begin if there is surplus sir by vocation of different sector people uh, no 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 sir if we have surplus then we have time to think about different <laughs> yes. uh, segment yes. of our uh, life yes so when you know you already have so you know, when you are a hunting gathering band you know you have to think every time about ki where will the you know food for the next you know time come next time ka khana kahan se aayega you know i have to kill something or otherwise i'll go hungry right but when there is surplus you know not everyone is not bothering about food and you know they have time to think about other things and they start thinking you know why what why is this happening why is that happening you know when i was dreaming what was my soul doing and all those things i talked in the first class regarding tyler right the yes, primitive sir. man thinking and then you know you know inventing religion similarly a lot of time to think then art culture comes up you know so this is also an effect of surplus trade when you have you know enough of something you know you want to exchange it and get something else writing and script writing and script is a very important aspect of trade you know writing began with trade when people started trading they wanted to keep a record of what they are trading and how much so i have given you you know 10 sacks of grain so i want to keep a track of that so on a clay on a clay tablet i make 10 marks like this 1 2 3 4 5 6 like that then a few centuries later you know this guy, the guy who is doing this he realizes no that instead of drawing 10 lines if i make a symbol like this for 10 that will be better this for 11 this for 12 so different kinds of symbols are invented it keeps on developing 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 till the time we have something called as script so keeping the record of transactions in trade gave birth to scripts so scripts also are born out of surplus because trade is born out of surplus right yes okay. sir so lot of other things will be, you know here status of women even the appearance of new diseases when you have lot of surplus lot of grain is just lying there and lot of rats are coming for that grain when the rats come in a densely populated place what begins what do we have plague plague so first you know the first instances of plague come in the neolithic age 10000 bc onwards before that there is no instance of any plague first time when people started doing agriculture they had surplus plagues appears okay so all these things are you know associated with economic changes okay now lp vidyarthi lp vidyarthi while listing different types of tribes based on their economic subsistence he says something very important he says that what he was writing was momentary momentary it is for just you know temporary whatever i am writing so i am writing that this tribe is hunter gatherer this tribe is pastoralist this tribe is you know uh, agriculturist whatever i am writing so you know it has there is a tendency of people you know to they want to be great so what they will write is you know what i am writing is for ages to come it is not going to change what i have written is a you know something written in stone and my legacy will stay forever but this great guy lp vidyarthi says no what i am writing is temporary momentary it is not going to stay for long in fact every ethnograph is momentary why 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 is like that because it's uh, from time to time it people or uh, the human being adapt and change yes diffusion yes. culturalism acculturism and all yes concept. so for example the chenchus another guy hymandorf 
when Heimendorf studied them. But before that, who is Heimendorf? Anyone? Who is this guy Heimendorf? Anyone, guys? We discussed in the last class only, class two, regarding Heimendorf. There was no one in the last class, class two. No sir. Okay. There was no one. Heimendorf from which country? Anyone? Britain. Looks like Austria. a German word. Yes. Yeah, you are correct. So Austria, Germany, and they are very similar. What is an Austrian is also a uh, German. Austria, German, they are very similar. You know, their language is similar. Their names are similar. So it's basically Austrian. He came to India in 1940s. Spent around 40 years studying in India. Studied a lot of tribes, especially Chenchus and some Naga tribes. So when Heimendorf studied them in the 1940s, they were mostly hunter gatherers. But if you go to that place now, you will see many of them doing menial labor work. Someone is doing a rickshaw pulling. Someone is working as a security guard. Someone is, you know, you know, doing labor work in MG and REGA, and REGA scheme, you know, building roads and all. Someone has gone into crime, stealing, theft, and all those kind of things. So Chenchus have become like this. Why have they become like this? What happened to this hunting gathering tribe? Sir, so destroyed due to diffusionism. Just diffusionism. So many factors. One is diffusionism. You know that some because of outside contact they lost lost their hunting gathering. So diffusion. What else? Environmental changes and political influence. Political Parks influence like protection act. Forest like displacing. Act. Very important. Very yes. important. The forest laws. Forest laws of the British and then Indian government. You know you Don't cannot. Just... So Indian government, you know, decide. Uh, you know. Passed our, our uh, Forest Rights Act. When did they pass Forest Rights Forest Rights Act? Which year? Guys, two thousand six. Two thousand six. So it is. You know, it took so long for the government to realize that these forests belong to these tribals. And and so the LPG British. LPG the the British used to think. Yeah, British used to think that the forest belongs to them, and the tribals are you know kind of. You know, stealing animals and trees from the their property. After independence, the government that was formed in India, unfortunately and sadly, they had the same colonial mindset, and even they felt that the tribals are stealing government property. It was only in two thousand six that they realized you know, that for you know, it belongs to them. It is their right. So, taking away their land rights, you know, they cannot hunt. You know, giving the animals the protection, they cannot be hunted. so this kind of you know government policies also we'll come to all these later so government policies diffusion and many more things you know led to chenchus declining from you know proud hunter gatherers to menial laborers here coming from this lp vidyarthi's great acceptance of things being momentary in ethnography we get something called typological and processual approach so keep in mind whatever we will be studying for 3 3 and a half months whether it we are studying about tribal economy whether we are studying about tribal political systems their family their marriage their kinship whatever remember everything is momentary nothing is static and stationary what we are doing is we are trying to describe them at one given point in time and they are not always going to stay the same what we are trying to study is called typological approach we are trying to place them in types type a type b type c hunting gathering you know uh, pastoralist uh, agriculturist we are trying to you know set some types for them typological approach but in reality what is happening is all types are changing and all types are moving towards the modern westernized industrial society gradually whether willingly or unwillingly or forced forcefully they are all moving towards one type of you know society this acceptance of everything changing and moving towards you know from point a moving from point a to point b and everything lying somewhere here on this continuum is called processual approach okay got it so can can you repeat the processual approach part yeah so typological approach is when we place them in types so you know this is for example uh, this you know band society 
and you give examples of banned society for example you say sentinelies then you say uh, chiefdom some african cultures have chiefdom then you say uh, for example you know state society like today's modern states india pakistan so you you try to give examples some examples for banned society some examples from chiefdom some examples from state society but these are just you know typological approach you are trying to place them under some types that is not going to be all you know all the time these banned societies are gradually moving from banned to chiefdom to state all of them are moving this acceptance of everything moving towards one direction everything lying between two different points somewhere on between the so this is point a the original form and this is point b towards which they are moving all the societies lie somewhere here some are still very near the original form some are in between some have reached more like a western society all of them lie somewhere on this continuum this thinking of everything lying on a continuum and always moving towards a direction is called processual approach okay yes sir thank you got it okay yeah so we have to remember that whatever we will be studying you know that you know, uh, tribal marriage or customs or family or kinship or polity or economical systems we are forcefully trying to place them in some types we are trying to forcefully study them in typological way but in reality if you go on the ground you will not find in them in the same way as written in the book because of the processual changes happening these changes called detribalization are happening constantly where the tribes are not staying tribes anymore we will study this in tribe caste continuum tribe caste continuum in paper 2 concept given given by whom tribe caste continuum who has given the concept anyone remembers okay so two people have given this concept i am not able to recall the name of the american guy there was an american guy and then there was one indian ranjit uh ranjit guha i think but basically this concept is copied from robert redfield who gave the concept of folk urban continuum folk society to urban society we'll study this folk urban continuum was con this concept was copied and studied in india as tribe caste continuum okay uh the causes for this detribalization and changes can be internal or external the change can be internal also for example you know a tribe invent something so for example you know these these uh, hunter gatherers they invented they found out or they discovered you know that the seeds can sprout into plants and they will have more food or they invented the process of you know domesticating animals and they had a better food supply so they moved into pastoralism so from hunting gathering they changed to pastoralism that is an internal invention it is not being forced from outside right so cause can be internal also but in most cases the cause of change of society is, ex is external in most cases contacts with outsiders and diffusion of things from outsiders which is called acculturation you know one culture gets traits and practices for from other culture and, and incorporates it this acculturation one culture you know becoming like other culture can be willful or can be forced so lot of willful things you know like us in india here you know listening songs of western bands or people you know trying to copy k pop which country k pop guys anyone k pop korea. which country korea south korea korean so, korean you know, so south korea is going to be the new usa there was a time when usa you know was dominating the people psyche and have used to listen to american songs american movies american dress now what is happening is lot of korean music korean soaps serials korean styles korean web series can you name anyone squid game <laughs> <laughs> squid game <laughs> yeah so they are you know becoming the you know fashion so korea is becoming the new usa so this is called willful 
acculturation no one is forcing korea has not come here to colonize us we are taking it willfully willful acculturation you know we like it so we take it that is also one way external you know, externally something changes our culture but then it can be forced also for example democracy in india it is not willful yes in the 1950 4750 we realized that fine we are now already used to it so let's continue with it but it did not began that way right it was brought and planted here by a colonial power so lot of things you know lot of changes that are happening in the tribes first of all some of them may be internal but mostly they are external first thing and in the external also very few are willful most of them are forced they are forced they have no way to do it i mean if you just stop their access to forest what will they do they have to leave hunting gathering right so we'll you know get into more details when we study the problems of indian tribes we'll study this in more detail today we are talking about indian uh, i mean tribal economy only so we'll limit ourselves to that now here is a concept geographical determinism anyone who has had geography geography in you know, optional earlier but i know this yeah yes tell me suraj geography determines the way we live or way we eat for example if someone is living in a cold area and uh, nearby so mm -hmm. their living will be quite different than the mm -hmm. person living in a plain or a saharan area mm -hmm. and this also is applicable on physical structure that uh, mountains men that some what mm -hmm. we call nepal or ladakh they are shorter mm -hmm. in height whereas mm -hmm. plain ones they are quite having a long strata okay geographical determinism yes so now coming to trying to link geographical determinism with our topic today an, an anthropologist you will not read about her in many books lorna marshall lorna marshall what she did is lorna marshall you know she's a very interesting and inspiring person because you know we give a lot of credit to franz boas about field work that franz boas said you know that you must go to the field before franz boas people were not doing field work he said no you must go to the field so franz boas become very important but this lady even before franz boas she went to the field and she studied these guys the kung or the san she studied geographical determinism in them what she saw was what she saw was the sharing among the san so what she sees there is for example you know i am a san guy i go for hunting i and my friend two people of you know it, it's a it's it's a settlement of some 30 families big settlement 30 is too big 10 families a settlement of 10 families which may be 57 60 people two guys out of that go for hunting we take all that risk you know you see that their you know arrows are poisoned you know if and and did you notice you know in the video it said that you know people who have cuts or scratches on their body they are not allowed to make the arrows did you notice that in the video yes sir yes sir for those yes, who don't notice you know it says that those who have cuts and scratches are not allowed to make that you know use that larvae and make the poison because that poison is so poisonous that 25 millionth of a gram can kill a rat Brilliant. and yes, there is no there is no antidote till date for that poison so that poison in my arrow it is so dangerous you know i can get hurt i can get killed and then i am you know going after big animals if the giraffe gives me a kick you know my you know, if the giraffe not giraffe yeah giraffe yeah. if giraffe you know kick lands on my chin then i don't know where i will land so taking that much risk you know i go and i hunt and after all that hunting i just get a uh, say for example a uh, small rabbit small rabbit is all i got nothing else we two come home in our settlement what will we do what will happen you try people will mock us 
they will anyways mock you know even if i get a jir- <laughs> giraffe they would have mocked me but getting a rabbit obviously will mock me but what will i do even after being mocked So share it equally among others. Share it and not share. just share it. Share it equally. Mm-hmm. Very important part is not just sharing, but sharing it equally. I took all the risk doesn't mean that I will take a bigger share. I will share it equally among every family. Whatever be the size of my hunt. Now, Lorna Marshall thought that where does this extraordinary behavior come from? She found out that because of the hot and humid climate, they cannot store meat. they have no technology to store anything and unfortunately you know the tribes there are some other tribes living in the same climate they have this kind of you know technology some tribes i'm not uh, i have not come across the names but for example there's a tribe a that lives in the same climate of uh, san but what they do is they have understood how to make pickle pickling of meat so they cut the meat in small parts they dry it they put lot of salt and other things in that and they make pickle out of it and it will not get spoiled and it can be eaten even next year preserving this preservation art is not known to the bushmen so what they do is you know they live from hand to mouth they live from moment to moment in the morning breakfast they get something breakfast is over done that is it nothing is there for lunch again lunch for lunch they have to get something kill something and eat for the lunch again for dinner they have to kill something obviously they don't eat three meals like us maybe they eat just one or two meals but tribes like this san and hadza you know they don't store anything at all not even for the next meal forget the next day or the next week because of the humid climate they cannot so they don't want to spoil the entire thing so share it they share it whatever be the size so this humid climate geography is determining this cultural practice of sharing and this tribe that has the you know preservative uh, preservation technique they don't share much that is what she shot she, she she saw and this is called comparative approach she is comparing the two tribes what next she did is this finding that geography determines this sharing thing she extrapolated expanded that without visiting the inuits where are the inuits located who are the inuits Okay. Near the polar regions. Polar area. Near, polar area. Polar regions. Any other word for them? Any other word? Irula, I guess. Uh, no. <laughs> no. He, Who is that? Who is saying Irula? Who is that Irula? Sir, it's me. Suraj. Suraj. Don't do that. Sir, Suraj. Its name is from East. Where is Irula and Eskimo. where is Eskimo? Eskimo. Yes, Eskimo. So how can you, oh, you know say? Just you know do Google image search. Look at an image of an Eskimo and look at an image of an image of an Irula. <laughs> and you will understand what blunder you have made <laughs> so okay so eskimo eskimo is a outdated term the word now used is inuits when when lorna was studying she was still calling them eskimo so she igloo. never went to the eskimo lands yes someone is saying anything igloo igloo is the place where they live okay eskimo are the people they make igloos where they live right igloo is not the people igloo is the how house that they make yes sir yeah okay madhav i think it's madhav yes sir yeah yeah so you know lorna marshall she thought that these guys she did not visit them but she just imagined that the bushmen are sharing because of the hot climate because the food gets wasted so they have to share it now these inuits they are living inside a fridge literally right the climate is so cold you can say that they are living inside a fridge nothing gets you know rotten so they don't have to worry about food being waste, wasted if they get a big catch they can preserve it so they would not share because food is not getting wasted so lorna marshall says that because they live in the very cold climate food is not getting wasted so as per geographical determinism the inuits may not be sharing their meat moreover she thought you know she thought that also this because she thought that the eskimos are very self centered why because she saw that uh, she, she came to know that they live in nuclear families they are they are one of the very rare examples of a primitive tribe living in a nuclear family 
so they live in small nuclear family not caring caring about their other relatives and living in a cold climate food not getting wasted so she thought that they do not share like the bushman now my question is was she right no sir they share equally Who and reason for living in nuclear family was due to small size of igloo okay but who proved her wrong boas sir trans boa boas so our hero franz boas in 1900s around 1900s you know he he goes to uh alaska he studied lot of eskimo people and he was amazed exact same thing like the you know uh san whatever the size of the catch howsoever risky it may have been you don't take a bigger share you distribute among the entire settlement equally so geographical determinism falls flat on its face when sharing is seen here right yes sir now coming to something that i had told we will discuss later i said that someone called karl polani so i said you know that um this guy who is called the father of economic anthropology malinowski malinowski so malinowski began economic anthropology so he is called the father of economic anthropology but what you know made economic anthropology di- diverge and go away from formal economics is karl polanyi's work which you know translated into the formalism versus substantivism debate what is the debate about anyone Debate Anyone? is a debate hmm. is regarding whether the simple societies can be understood by the economic terminologies or economic systems that we use today in our complex societies. Yes. So the modern economic principles of profit loss, demand supply, can the same principles be used to understand the economies of simple societies? Let's see. No, sir. Yeah. So we'll look into this. So the formalist, the formalist are the group. that says that yes modern economics is great modern ex- economics does explain simple societies so formalists led by scholars like herskovitz and snyder they believe that even simple societies have these even simple societies you know can be understood by modern economic principles of profit maximization i would want to maximize my profit i would follow demand supply they also feel that whether it is simple society whether it is complex society whether it is 10000 bc whether it is today man across time and space has always faced scarcity scarcity is always prevalent you know prevalent all pervading all pervasive scarcity of resources has always been there scarcity of resources is universal and because of this scarcity man has lesser resources so man thinks a lot before utilizing resources because this scarcity makes man a rational guy man is a rational creature you know we keep on thinking so i have 10 rupees i have to buy something this guy is saying you know 10 rupees i will give you this bundle of you know spinach in 10 rupees i will say no i have only 10 rupees he is saying 10 rupees let me bargain and say 7 rupees i want to maximize my 10 rupees that i have i want to buy him you know more things so i will pay only 7 for the spinach and save the 3 rupees for something else but the seller he thinks that i got this you know for 5 rupees let me sell it for 10 rupees he will not come to 7 rupees so both of us here are trying to maximize our profit you know both of us tr- are trying to maximize our resources because the resource is scarce and we both are rational beings so this rationality you know makes us you know Uh, this rationality comes from scarcity because of this rationality we think of maximizing our resources and we try to share as little as possible this is what the formalists say okay what substantivists have to say 
the substantivists led by Karl Polanyi, Marcel Sa Marcel Salins, Dalton Bohannon, etc. They say the following. They say that modern economic principles are insufficient. They are totally insufficient to explain simple societies. Not just that. Not only are the modern economic principles insufficient in explaining simple societies, they can't even explain complex societies. The modern economic principles of demand, supply, profit, maxim maximization, they fail to explain even complex economies at time. For example, let's take example, boycott China. Suddenly there is a, you know, a, in Eastern Ladakh, there was a skirmish and soldiers died. There was a national fervor because of which we all took an oath that from today, no Chinese phone. Remember that? Remember yes, that or sir. not? No, boycott yes, China. Yes, but rationally thinking, the Chinese phones have better camera quality. You no, know, it's, it's a myth that Chinese products are bad. Rationally thinking that they're good products coming at a cheaper rate, having a you know better you know uh, camera quality and a lot of other features which are not there in the Samsung or a lot of other phones. Forget our India made phones. You know, but still a lot of people, you know, kept this rationality aside and bought phones, including me and regretting now. And I, I thought that I will never, never buy a Chinese phone. And someone was offering me to buy a Chinese phone, but I, you know, bought a Samsung phone under the, yeah. So my wife is getting angry because I said someone, my wife said, you know, she was, she was gifting me a Chinese phone which would have had better features at a lesser price, but I went for the Samsung phone and now I'm regretting. I had kept my rationality aside because of that nationalist fervor. You know, so hence sometimes some political things and not economic ideology, but political ideology can also influence economic behavior of consumers, traders, investors. A lot of investors would have thought, let's not invest in China. Let's not take funds from China because of nationalistic thinking. So, this national fervor and boycotting of China cannot be explained using modern economic principles. So even complex economies sometimes cannot be explained by modern economic principles. Got it right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Right. So the substantivists are showing that, uh, saying that, you know, this modern economic principles that you're bragging, bragging about, they are not able to explain even complex societies forget you know in a, a simple society they are not even able to explain complex societies for which they are made third point they say is that scarcity is not universal the scarcity that we're saying has always been all pervasive omnipresent is false scarcity is not universal they believe that early man lived in a plentiful prosperous life didn't we see that in our video point. today you know in, in our video today Yes, sir. Yes. We saw that working lesser number of hours, they are getting more calories, 55% more protein, you know, a lot of more, you know, uh, calories while working around average six hours a day. Yes or no? We saw in the video, right? Yes, sir. So yes. citing these kind of examples in Marcel Salins, Marcel Salins. In his book, Stone Age Economics, he called the hunter gatherers as the original affluent society. He said that they were way, way more affluent than us. There was no scarcity at all. Plenty of land and forests to hunt and gather from. You just pluck a fruit and eat it. You just kill an animal, eat it. It's not, you know, they are, the numbers are not falling. They are way too many. And this, you know, this, this stone, stone Age Economics, they also knew how to utilize the resources. They were not, you know, kind of exploiting or over exploiting they just took how much they needed and they lived in prosperity plentifulness scarcity is a modern phenomena caused by modern hyper consumerism hyper consumerism we go to a market and we start buying things that we don't even need happens with you we buy the thing first and think how to use it later has it happened to you? Yes, sir. When the things are yeah, in extra discount. It happens. Yeah. No, they give, they're giving a discount. Are you a discount? Yes, Let's sir. take it. We'll think of, you know, how to use it later. 
this is capitalism this is hyper consumerism you know this hyper consumerism you know trying to get things even that i don't need even that i cannot you know i will not have placed in my house to keep or i will not get time to utilize still i am buying it this kind of greed and hyper consumerism has what it has caused this scarcity okay that is what the substantivist says okay you now things that are not really needed are pushed in the market to create artificial needs even you know this is happening with the tribes so if someone happens to go to a tribal market you know suppose there's a tribal market where your father or grandfather has visited your father has visited. you you ask what he would have seen in the tribal market some 20 30 years ago now you visit the same tribal market and you will see plastic things are being sold there plastic chairs you know plastic toys but you know 10 20 years ago that was not the case they only used to sell small scale stuff you know maybe a, an old lady lady sitting on a small you know uh you know gamcha which are you know the small piece of cloth and she is just selling maybe a few eggs from a desi murgi and maybe a few you know uh, mushrooms a few stuff that she's grown in her small garden or maybe you know selling some rice beer and all small you know scale stuff tribal products but now you'll see a lot of plastic things which tribals are also buying and you know even if they don't need it so gradually they are also changing so gradually when they start you know needing things that did they start you know uh, buying things so for example cigarette is sold there okay for example cigarette foreign liquor is sold in a tribal place so tribals have their own rice beer which they make at home they have their own hookah but some of them may get attracted to this and they start buying this they get addicted to this do they have the money to afford this all the time no sir so what do they do they borrow whom Take do they loan. borrow from whom do they borrow from there is an outsider diku as the tribes called in indian history diku outsider shopkeeper who has set up a shop he tells him fine no no issues i will give you money you just give me 120% interest don't worry this tribal doesn't understand 120% is how much and then he his son his son son they are not able to you know pay off the debt sir so this scarcity where did it come from was it natural artificially created artificially created you know we have seen that in indian tribes it happened right when the outsiders went and they you know so so that is why the these tribals like santhals and mundas they revolted because they saw this outsiders as an extension of the colonial state yeah so coming back to the substantivists scarcity is not universal understood this point everyone yes sir okay point number 4 of the substantivists economy in simple societies is embedded in the social fabric so this is the society like see, see for example if it's a football on a small part on a small patch so on the football there are many black black patches one small patch is economy it is a small part that is this is a society and this small embed, embedded part here is the economy economy is a small part of the society is not very important not that important not all important economy in simple societies it is is embedded in the social fabric peripheral markets we'll read more about peripheral markets but to explain it very simply if say the market that we get our stuff from near your house wherever you stay suddenly that market disappears what will happen tomorrow to you the market where you get your food and everything from if that disappears what happens to you we look what for another nearby markets yeah i mean we cannot we cannot run our life without that right that market right but in primitive simple societies markets are not that important market is just a way of leisure and you know they have, it's like a you know fair a mela periodical market you know, once in a 15 days you know once in a month or once in a week they some sell some stuff they have some fun you know they drink and enjoy and party and they also find mates in their markets markets may a lot of social things are happening for them 
other than economic transactions only not only purely economic stuff but also a lot of social things happen there are a lot of tribes where you know they after marriage the woman meets her in-laws or sorry woman meets her parental family side her mother and father only at the market market is a place where they meet their you know parental family in some tribes market is the place where they find mate for themselves so these tribal markets peripheral markets they are a small part of the society they are embedded in the society they are not all important like today modern society where economy is itself an independent part of the society without which the society cannot run market is irreplaceable for us but it's not irreplaceable for the tribals in simple societies kinship relatives family is more valued than resource maximization so there are a lot of examples for you know for example have you heard about bride price yes sir heard about what is bride price uh the जो ग्रूम है उसके साइड को वो ब्राइड को यानी मैरिज करने के लिए वो प्राइस पे करना पड़ता है सो इट इज प्राइस टू गेट ब्राइड इज इट दीपक यस सर ओ दीपक यस गुड आई डिड आई डिड नॉट नो यू आर इन द क्लास बिकॉज़ आई डिड नॉट हियर यू टॉक आई जस्ट जॉइंड सर आई वाज लेट फ्रॉम द ऑफिस ओह ओहो आई थिंक यू मिस्टर गुड क्लास एनीवेज आई थिंक यू विल गेट द रिकॉर्डिंग यस यस आई विल गेट द रिकॉर्डिंग सर yeah so bride price you know lot of tribes you know uh, the groom is the guy is not able to get enough bride price you know to get a bride so what happens is he goes to his kinsmen his kinsmen you know they you know offer their own you know cattle their own you know uh, wealth and their own tools and stuff and carpets and stuff whatever is valuable they you know offer it you know uh, to this guy you know so that you know this poor guy can afford a bride so the kin are very important and this is just one example in everything the kin are more important the kin have always been more important than anything else for simple societies sir it is not in gender inequality what is offering bride to someone okay so is that uh, madhav yes sir yeah madhav so you know um, when this gen this bride price topic will discuss when we discuss about marriage okay okay uh, so it will become very clear to you that this is uh, something way better than what we practice in our societies today the dowry thing or any other thing this bride price is not a selling of women it is a much more important thing we'll we'll look into this okay when we talk about when we come to this topic okay madhav okay sir yeah yes sir you know so you know very important line that marshal sahlins had said money is to west what kinship is to the rest west the western world you know they value money so much but what is most valuable to west is money but what is most valuable to rest of the world that is the non western societies the africans the asians is kinship rather than money so this is line that you can be used you know even in your essays and everything everywhere else okay so this is what are the points mentioned about the substantivists you know or uh, in support of their theory and against the you know the formalists now today is only 9 pm so next class we will discuss some examples to you know get more into the formalist substan substantivist thing to get you know understand more about the you know the the simple economies to understand get some examples from around the world and understand them in a more better way so next class we will discuss about the kula exchange the pot latch and sambaga pig fests theek hai fine guys yes okay? sir yes okay and yes. one one suggestion here so whenever questions like these come you know about debates so debate of formalism substantivism or, or any other debate whether you know uh, to keep the tribes in isolation or to assimilate the tribes whatever whenever a question comes about any debates your conclusion can be like this you know that the debate is still on debate is still going on but in the process what is happening is both sides are presenting their own points doing more research and in the process the subject of anthropology is getting enriched okay all right yes so right so i have so a question so with that yeah yeah yes you know uh, so 
so it's namrata so yeah, regarding namrata, if we have a yeah. question on formalists and substantivists uh, yeah. if the debate or the views are asked should we yeah. mention in a differentiated in the table format or should we write no, in no, points no. do not do not write in table do not okay. this 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 you know uh, in table what happens is you know you 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 uh, reduce the number in the reduce the uh, so you you try to give so many points so it's like this you make a table and you know you the space available for every point is very less right what we want here is very detailed points with examples maybe a diagram so you say kula there you draw this diagram of clockwise anti clockwise clockwise movement that kula ring diagram is there in the book yes sir. maybe you know when discussing potlatch maybe you can you know uh, uh no potlatch mein diagram will not be there you can if you want but diagram sembaga pig fest uh, or what you can do is you know maybe draw a world map and say you know the british columbia potlatch uh the um, uh, the trobriand island kula and then uh, the sem you know the uh, melina melanasia for sembaga pig fest so these kind of debates should be more like you know uh, discussion rather than point wise point wise okay. answers are much more suited to our uh, biological anthropology here it is uh, better to write in paragraphs okay sir yeah thank you okay all right guys anything uh, else any other question okay so what we'll do is we'll end the class the temperature has already reached i think around 1 degree now here so we'll end the class and next class uh, so 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 what happened is this, this was a very short notice or very short notice you got i think you got to know today itself or yesterday regarding the class right yesterday i think was it yesterday yes, or today sir. yesterday okay so um uh, next class uh, let me just check today what is the date today is uh, 30th which is thursday thursday sorry so uh, 31st first second second december will be monday no thursday friday saturday sunday sunday sunday, 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 sunday second third december which will be monday can we have a class on third december monday in the evening yes sir 8 o'clock yes sir oh uh, okay it is 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 8 o'clock okay or 6 pm better with uh, can, can 6 pm be better for everyone 6 pm no, 7 pm there was on class sir 7 pm there was a clash with other classes yes sir oh monday also do you have that clash yes sir every day mm -hmm. what about morning time ah uh, morning time okay sir. at what time sir big yeah, morning sir. Morning, morning would be, be difficult, sir. Difficult, difficult no? sir. Difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will try eight pm, but eight pm is seven uh, pm. Okay. Office time or not possible, sir. Right, right. Okay, fine. Eight pm will be fine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Eight pm fine for me. Yes, sir. Monday eight mm. pm. Okay. Yes, sir. Monday. Sure, sure. so next class will be monday 2nd of uh, no 3rd is it 3rd 3rd january right yes 3rd monday 3rd january 8 pm will be the next class link will be shared with you all guys theek okay? hai yes sir sure fine i hope the class was helpful and i hope uh, we learned something today and uh, with that we'll end the class good night guys good, good night, night sir good night sir, good night, sir. Thank, thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir welcome guys welcome thank you sir welcome Uh, sir, yeah. just one yeah, yeah. query. Uh, sir, whatever you taught today, uh, which reference book we can follow? You know, just to uh, yeah for an add-on so or understand. This part, yeah, this part uh, is very nicely given in your uh, Naresh Kumar Vaid in search of ourselves. Yes, sir. In search of ourselves. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, sir. So, and if, if if any concept you feel is not clearly explained, you can refer to Brain Tree. If N K Vaid is insufficient. But I believe NK Vaid is good enough for this. Sure, so actually, sir, I, I was thinking of a bit limiting of sources initially. Yeah, yeah. So, so NK Vaid, NK very Vaid. much, very much, yeah. NK Vaid, yes, and so you have attended the discussion, and I hope you guys are taking running notes. Yes, If sir. If you are taking running notes, just add mm -hmm. the running running notes with NK Vaid, and that should be more than enough. 
Sure, sir. Okay, okay sir. Okay. Hey, guys. Okay. Nice Thank, you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Welcome. Good night, sir. Good night.